How is everybody doing? How many people had a chance to wake up early this morning? All right. Well, it's always good when we get a chance to celebrate uh, Canada and uh, what God has blessed this nation with. Amen. Uh, it's just a good time when we can get around to celebrate. But as Pastor Rick mentioned this morning at the beginning of the service, how much greater opportunity do we have to worship a God? How much greater reason do we have to celebrate? And, and for that reason, our worship should never be silent. Our worship should never be withheld. Our worship should never be toned down. You get that? Because He is far more worthy than anything we could ever give. He is far more worthy of anything we could even comprehend, and we're going to get the rest of eternity to prove it. Amen? Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's a great day. How many believe springs on the way? All right, some of you have faith. The rest of you are realists. Minus 25, can you believe that? That's just too cold this morning. I had to fill up with gas this morning, and I, I decided to pick the slowest pump in the city. At least it felt like that. I was filling up, and it, it was just cold. It was cold. And then I got here, and I'm like, it's still cold in here. Uh, so that's why we got to move around a little bit to warm up. So hopefully you're doing good. But today we want to continue on our Naked and Unashamed series. Now, for those of you who have been with us from the very beginning, and if you're keeping track, we are now number eight. Point eight in this. And today we're going to deal with membership has its rewards and its responsibilities. You see, uh, I was reminded this week of how many times we think we have rights. Anybody think they have rights? Oh, good. Oh, yeah, there's some honesty that rises up there. But especially in the world, we all have these rights. We have a right for this. We have a right for that. We have a right. And I want to suggest to you is anytime you have a right you have a responsibility that goes along with it, okay? Trying to have a right without a responsibility makes absolutely no sense. So in order to have rights, you need to have responsibilities. And those responsibilities need to be fulfilled in order for those rights to be realized. And the same is true in the local church. The membership has its rewards. There are benefits to coming to church. And I can tell by the fact that you're sitting in this place that you would agree with that statement. Because if you didn't think there was a benefit to going to church, you wouldn't be here this morning. You would be off somewhere else. But the fact that you're here shows that you, there are benefits to coming to church. But I want to suggest to you today that not only are there benefits, there are responsibilities that go along with that. Being here is just the beginning of what God has in store for you and what His plans are for you. And it's time that some of us totally understand what it means to fulfill the promises that we have. Because I have long proposed this, and I have long suggested this, and uh, I must say, as a church, and I'm speaking to each of you, I I'm proud of your involvement. I'm proud of how you guys get involved. Uh, I was talking with some of my pastors of some larger churches than us, and, and they are happy if they get 25% of their people involved in ministry, they're extremely happy if you get 25. Most of them are around 20% of people in their church actually are actively involved in ministry. When I look at this church, I see that we have about 78, 79% of people who are actively involved in ministry. So I think that's phenomenal. But as I've said before, I'm not going to stop preaching this message till we have 100%. Because in order for this church to reach its full potential, we need every single person in this church reaching their full potential and contributing overall to what God's plans are for this congregation. So I'm going to pull out one of my favorite passages of Scripture today. If you got your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, when I look back through my notes, I've probably preached on this passage of Scripture, I don't know, probably a dozen times, maybe even more. Uh, it's probably the, the most preached upon passage of Scripture for me personally. And... I think it relates to, to my calling, because I'm not your, your typical pastor that just wants a big church, okay? I want a healthy, active church. To me, size doesn't matter as much as the fact that every single person is reaching their full potential. 
because that's my heart's cry, is to see each and every one of you reach the full potential that Christ has for you. Not just to be better than your neighbor, not just to, to be better at doing this or better at doing that, but to reach beyond your own ability, your own thinking, your own gifts and talents, and to reach into the supernatural where you're doing things that only God can do through you. And that's when life gets exciting. That's when we can really enjoy it, is when the Holy Spirit is working through us. So if you got your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to read from 12 to 26. Now in this passage, Paul is using the reference of the human body to describe to us how the church should function uh, in today's culture and age. Verse 12, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free, but we all have been baptized into one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not part of the body because I am not the hand, that doesn't make any less part of the body. Or if an ear says, I am not part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body was an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts. And God has put each of these where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yet there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some of the body, parts of the body, have seemed weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And all the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest of care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together so that the extra honor and care can be given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. And if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can discover the truth of your purposes through it. And God, I pray that we would hear what you're saying to us today. Lord, not only would we hear it, but we would be able to apply it to our being and to our own purposes. And God, just fill us with your thoughts, fill us with your mind. And God, just shut out all other distractions at this time we ask in your name. Amen. So today's message is dealing with membership, okay? Fellowship, whatever word you want to label it. And I would suggest to you that being a part or being a member of a church is vital to your personal growth. If you want to reach your full potential, you need to be part of a church and you need to be active in it. Uh, There's a story of a man who once came into a pastor's office He sat down and said, Pastor, I want to be a part of a church. I don't have time to get involved in this or that, but I I just feel the need to be have a, a religious component in my life. The pastor sat down for a minute and said, Honestly, sir, I don't think you're fit in here, but I do know a place where you probably will fit in. He goes, Okay. He said, Well, what's the name of it? Well, they don't really have a name. Okay, well, what's their phone number? Uh, Sorry, but they don't have a phone number. And he goes, well, the pastor said, well, but they do have an address. I'll give you their address and you can go visit them. So the next Sunday, the man drove up to the address and all he saw was this dilapidated building. The doors were wide open, the windows were all broken, and it just looked a mess. The next week, he called up the pastor and he said, Pastor, I think you gave me the wrong address. He said, no, no, I didn't. I gave you the right address. He goes, but it was all torn down and dilapidated. He goes, the... There was nothing for me there. He, the pastor said, you know what? That church, the roles are full of people just like you. And he thinks for a minute and thinks, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, wherever you have people who don't want to get involved, things fall apart. Things do not last. Things disintegrate. For you and I, we can understand that there are physical needs in a building, okay? Uh, God has blessed us with this, this, this building. It, it's an amazing blessing. But that doesn't mean it doesn't require upkeep and maintenance. 
And sometimes we look at those things as being trivial. The Apostle Paul put them as a labeled it as a less honorable, okay? You're not in the glory. You're not standing on the stage. You're not in lights. You're, you're not getting the recognition from everybody else. But there are still practical and simple needs that need to be taken care of. And maybe that's your calling. Maybe that's exactly what you need to be doing. And don't ever put that down. Don't ever think that one job in a church is less important than another job in the church, because it is not. In fact, every job, no matter how small, no matter how big, is vital to the church having success. In a church, we can simply have people who attend. Okay, We call them attenders. But if that's all you have, it's not good enough. For a church to prosper, we need a very valuable thing. For some people, they may consider it scary. Some people try to avoid it at any cost. You know what I'm thinking of? Commitment! There you go. Uh, I saw a wonderful ad up on 99th Street as you're driving. It's from Spence Diamonds, and it says, Commitment is an aphrodisiac. I was thinking, can I use that in my message? And that might offend people, so I can't use it, so sorry. Um, but it is awesome to think that commitment is necessary. In fact, commitment is so vital that without it, relationships fall apart. You believe that? Can you imagine having a husband and wife married with no commitment? It simply would not exist. It doesn't work. And that's why so many marriages today are falling apart because the commitment is not there. Well, I want to suggest to you that the same thing happens in our relationship with God. That it falls apart if there is no commitment. If we cannot commit to it, we will lose it. It will disintegrate. It will fall apart. So I would suggest that you need to commit to the body. We have to understand that we have a job to do. Each one of us as individuals have a job to do. But greater than that, Highway Christian Center has a job to do. We have a job in this community to be a lighthouse. We have a job wherever each and every one of you go to share the love of Christ with the people who do not know it. Now, I mentioned earlier that our our purpose statement here is together developing our God-given potential. This is something that really is my heart's cry. To me, it's a reason why I am a pastor. It means we have the desire to help every person who calls Highway Home to become all they can be. And I want to help each one of you discover and how to live that abundant life that is promised for us. But I can't do it alone. Okay, I can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. We're in this together, and that's why that first word together is so vital and so important. Okay, We're all in this together. National Geographic has a long history with the redwood trees. We photographed a 300-foot tall, 1,500-year-old tree that survived being cut. And it's... The scientists that study these trees, this is their favorite tree. It's the most complex architectural tree on earth that's known. But photographing it is nearly impossible. How many of you have seen the redwoods? How many would describe them as big? Good, I hope so. These trees are the largest living organisms on the earth. Okay, 300 feet tall. Now, to give you perspective on how tall that is, pretty much a 30-story building. Pretty much the same height as a CN Tower downtown. Okay, That's how tall these trees grow. Now, their girth, like how big around they are, is bigger than a Greyhound bus. Okay? That's pretty big. These trees can live up to 2,500 years. That's how old the oldest one is. 2,500 year trees. These are massive organisms. Like, now let me ask you a question. This is the, the fact that just completely blows my mind. If they're 300 feet tall, how far down do you think their root system goes? Between eight and 12 feet. 8 and 12 feet worth of roots. 
Now you ask yourself, how in the world do they stand? How in the world do they grow that tall if they can only have eight feet of base? You know the trees we have around here, you're exactly right. They're usually as tall above ground as they are underground. How do they stay? It's through cooperation. You see, one root system of one tree spreads out horizontally. They go, don't go down, they spread out horizontally. They then interlock with the root systems of other trees. So when you look at it, you can almost say that the entire redwood forest is one organism because they're all tied together. What I suggest to you today is that the same thing happens in the church. For us to reach the sky and then these trees, the reason why they can grow so tall is they don't have to put all their energy into putting roots down deep. Because they have the support of other trees around them, they can spend all their energy reaching for the sky. And I want to suggest to you, that's the way it should work in the church as well. That's the way it should function for us as well. Because when you come together, when you're part of a group, you don't have to do everything yourself. It's a part of being together with other people where other people can share the load and other people can be a part of it. That then you can use your energy to reach your full potential. You don't have to use your energy trying to just do the basics. By linking together and supporting one another, we can do more and reach higher than we could ever do alone. Together, we can develop in a greater way than we could ever develop alone. That's the very purpose of this church. You see, the church is not a building. The church is not a religious organization. The church is people. You. You are the church. And when you understand who you are, you can understand that it makes sense that we are doing this together. And I'm going to suggest some things today that make sense and will strengthen our relationships so that we can reach higher, we can do more, uh, we can increase that intimacy with the Father. John Warburg said, the church is not a place for people to gather occasionally for religious services. It's not one more social institution among many others. The church is God's dream for his most cherished creation. There's nothing like the church. There's no accomplishment, no organization, no country or civilization. There is nothing as important as the church. And only the church will survive to share God's eternity. Now, when the Apostle Paul refers to the church as a body, we can infer that there is a possibility that it may be healthy or unhealthy. Just like our own bodies can be healthy or they can be unhealthy. Now, just a quick survey. How many people here like being healthy? Dude, how many people enjoy being unhealthy? Good. It's unanimous. We all like being physically healthy. We would all prefer to be physically healthy. Well, I would suggest to you that the same is true with the church. We should want the church to be healthy. We should prefer the church be healthy. We should desire it and do everything we can to make it healthy. Uh, within your own body, how many of you realize that it takes work to be healthy? Anybody? Yeah? It doesn't just happen. Like I guess when you're born, you're probably the healthiest. But as things go on, if you don't take care of yourself, if you don't exercise, if you don't eat right, if you don't sleep right, what happens? You'd get less healthy. Now, just to ask simple questions. What is the benefit of having a healthy body? When we're talking about a physical body, what are, what are the benefits? Well, let's get into them. Number one, reduced discomfort. How many of you know how uncomfortable it is when you're unhealthy? It's just, it's uncomfortable, right? So by being healthy, you actually have less discomfort. Number two is you're less susceptible to disease. Okay, the healthier you are, the less sick you will get. It's kind of like a catch-22, because when you're sick, guess what? You can get more sick. 
Okay? When you're sick, you're more susceptible to getting more illness, more sickness. But when you're healthy, there's less chance of you getting sick. Okay? We would all understand that in the physical nature. Number three, you're, you have more energy and you feel better. Okay? How many attest to that? How many feel better when they're healthy? Anybody feel better when they're sick? Of course not. Okay, these are all basic things that you understand. Okay. Number four is you live a longer life. Did you know healthy people live longer? Not only do they live longer, they live happier. Okay, more fulfilled. Number five, more productivity. How many of you can feel that you get the same amount of work done when you're sick as when you're healthy? Anybody? What happens when we're sick? It's a chore to get up and, and go to the washroom, right? It's a chore to make something. It's When you're sick, your productivity goes way down. You're not able to accomplish half of what you could if you were healthy. Now, that's all with the natural body. But I would concur today that this is also true in the spiritual body of the church. A healthy church will be more comfortable because there will be less uh, fighting going on. There will be less antagonism going on. Uh, the church will be less susceptible to disease. Okay, Sin is a disease. It, it breaks through. The church will have more energy. It'll be more vital. Uh, the church will feel better. Okay, it'll, it'll be a place where people want to be because it's healthy. The church, I know this one doesn't really apply because Jesus already promised that his church would last forever. Okay, uh, but it also has more fullness of life. Now, more productivity, that's where we can really focus on. A healthy church will be more productive. Now, what are we being more productive doing? What's, what's the primary goal of the church? Okay, this is an easy one. Jesus said, his last breath, go and make disciples. Okay, don't ever forget this. Okay, this is a primary focus of the church. It's a primary reason why we are here. Everything else is secondary. Okay, we are saved to serve. Yes, we are to do things to tell other people about the love of God that we already have. Okay. Get that, get that, get that. That's our primary motivation. That's a primary reason. That's why we have a relationship with Christ is so that He can love us and He can love others through us. So when we look at the benefits of having a healthy spiritual body, we can understand that th it takes work. Okay, It takes work and effort to have a physical body that's healthy, and it takes work and effort to make a spiritual body healthy. When you have bacon and eggs, there are two parts, okay? One's a contributor, and one's a sacrificer. One gives his all, okay? You see, for the chicken, they contribute to the meal. The pig, he does a little bit more than contribute. And I want to suggest to you that God wants you to be a pig, God wants you to be a pig. He's not looking for contributions. He's not looking for you uh, just to, to give a little here or to do a little here. He wants all of you. He wants everything you got. He wants it all. And only then will you fully be satisfied and happy. So what is this commitment that God wants you to make to His church? To sum it up, we need to exist in unity, share responsibility, serve in ministry, and support the testimony of our church. Our commitment to the local church will give us a good picture of God's daily extension of grace and patience towards us. And true fellowship has a power to revolutionize our lives. Masks come off, conversations get deep, hurt gets vulnerable, lives are shared, accountability is invited, and tenderness flows. It's when people become real brothers and sisters. They shoulder each other's burdens. 
every single person is welcome in this church all the time. Every single person will receive the same honor, the same respect that we are able to give through Christ. Everybody gets the same thing. But if you want to be a member of this church, if you want to be in fellowship with us, there are responsibilities that come along with it. There are expectations that come along with it. And unfortunately, unless we each meet the area that God has given us and put us in place to do, the church will never reach its full potential if one or two of its members are not reaching their potential. Remember, the church is a body. The, the area that we will reach is directly proportional to each one of you as individuals. Without fulfilling your responsibility, as a church, we will never reach the full advantage that God has for us. Okay? It's up to each and every one of us as individuals. So let's just take some time and look at what this is saying. And put it this way. I would hope that nothing in here is something that you would disagree with. Okay? I would hope that this is something that you already agree with, but you just maybe need to be reminded of it. Number one is, I will protect the unity of my church. In 1 Peter 1.22 it says, Now you can have sincere love for one another as brothers and sisters because you were cleansed from your sins when you accepted the truth of the good news. So see to it that you really do love each other intensely with all your heart. So you're making a commitment here that you will lack loving towards other people. Now, I should say this off the start. Are we looking for perfection? No, because we're not perfect. And there are times when we jokingly bug Pastor Rick about this or that. Uh, but he likes it. <laughs> but what we're saying here is that we need to have an honesty of love towards one another. Of every single person who is here, whether they're a member or just an attender or if they're a visitor, whatever they are, each person receives your full love. That's the first expectation. Number two is by building intentional relationships. Hebrews 10.24 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Now, we've spent a lot of time talking about relationships and the need for them, how, how the church is all based on relationships. It, it's not a religion. It's not just a, a church service or song service or anything. It's a time for relationships to be kindled. I'm going to be honest with you. The way we structure our Sunday morning services are not inductive of building relationships. Okay, When we spend time worshiping, yes, we're doing it corporately, but that's not really building a relationship with the person beside you, okay? Because your focus should be on God, okay? When we're, we're preaching a message like this, there's not a, a lot of time to build relationship, okay? It's actually kind of a no-no, okay? We, we don't want you to be talking to your neighbor when someone's up here preaching. And maybe we give you five or ten minutes for fellowship to shake hands and to do that, but can you really honestly think that you can build a deep relationship with somebody five minutes a week? Not going to happen. We have to come up with ways in which we foster relationships with one another. Okay? We have our film and fellowship night, which again, most of the time you're watching a screen and we, we have time for coffee and that afterwards. But I want to suggest to you this, that each and every one of you needs to be part of a home group. We need it to every person to be a part of a home group. Why? Because it's in a home group setting where you can build relationship. That's where you can talk. That's where you can share. That's where you can uh, be yourself and share yourself and allow other people to enjoy that by refusing to gossip. Ooh, we're actually putting that in our list. Okay, Ephesians 4.29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Okay, we don't want to be people who gossip. Gossip, and the reason why we're putting this in, is gossip can tear a church apart. 
Gossip can destroy a church. So we're just going to say up front before anybody does it, we don't do it. Okay? Uh, the biblical precedent is if you've got something to say about a person, go and say it to them. Okay? Talk to them about it. If there's still a problem, bring a Christian brother along or sister alongside, and then talk to them. If there's still a problem, then bring it to the church. Okay? Never, never, never is it okay to gossip about somebody, and even if it's a prayer request. Number four, by following the leaders. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work may be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. I want to say here what a privilege it is to be a pastor in this church. Okay? Uh, I am enjoying it imme immensely. When people ask me how I'm doing, my, my catchphrase now that I'm saying is I'm having fun. I never could say that before. Okay, I did not have fun in my professions that I had before this. But now I can say I'm having fun because it's true. I enjoy being a pastor here. So thank you for that privilege. And part of the, the, the scary verse for me as a pastor is, they keep watch over you as men who must give an account. One day I am going to have to stand before God and give an account on my actions. Uh, but, but I can take this out of there. I think each and every one of us will have to do that one day. So it's not just us as pastors, but each one of us. But yes, we need to be a church that follows leadership. Now, you guys know my leadership style it is not heavy-handed. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to encourage you and strengthen you so that you hear from God what he wants you to do. And then as a corporate body, we will be in agreement together uh, to do things beyond any one of our own abilities. Number two, I will share in the responsibility of my church. The first part of that is by praying for its ministries. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 2 says, To the church of Thessalonians, in the God of the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace be to you. We always thank God for you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father the work you produce by faith, and your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. I expect and I hope that you are praying for this church on a daily basis. I hope that you are praying for the individual ministries of this church on a daily basis. Because it's the coding of prayer, it's the covering of prayer that will enable us to go beyond ourselves. To not get stuck in our own physical, natural abilities, but to start operating in the supernatural way that Christ intended. So be praying for it. One of the new initiatives I just came up with, and I think this is so smart, I'm going to patent it. We're going to create something called CPR. Anybody know what CPR stands for? CPR stands for Corporate Prayer Requests. Get it? CPR, Corporate Prayer Requests. We're going to create a list of, of prayers that we have as a church. Things that are, are prevalent and precedent upon this congregation, and we want everybody to be praying about these things every single day. Okay, So be looking for that in the next few weeks. We will get it out. The next aspect is by warmly welcoming those who visit. Romans 15.7 says, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. One of the biggest failings of Christians is that we become judgmental. It's very easy to do. It's very simple to do. But we're not allowed to do it. We are not the judges. When you are judgmental, you are calling yourself the judge. But who is a judge? Jesus Christ. He is a judge. Okay, He sent his Holy Spirit to bring judgment upon man. It's not our job to judge them. And it's very easy to do, especially when you're dealing with somebody who's a baby Christian, right? Because you've grown up, you know this is right, you know this is right, you know this is wrong, so you know all that. But a baby Christian comes in and does something that, oh, that's wrong. We're going to have to go tell them not to do that. How many think that's okay? How many of you think that's the work of the Holy Spirit? I think you should all put up your hand there. 
It is the Holy Spirit's job to bring conviction upon mankind. Nowhere in Scripture will you find it saying that it is your job to bring conviction upon somebody. It's not there. Every time you bring conviction or condemnation or judgment on somebody else, you are doing the work of the Holy Spirit. And now let me ask you a question. Who does a better job, you or the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit. So why don't we let the Holy Spirit do his job and we do our job? Our job is to let him work through us. Now, I know that sounds a little bit confusing, but simply put this. The Holy Spirit will be, bring perfect conviction upon people. Perfect. So, if you're really concerned with a brother or sister who is not doing things right, what should you do? Pray. Pray. Pray that the Holy Spirit will bring conviction on them. You know, you can do that. That's, that's totally biblical. You can pray that, God, this person's doing this, they're going to hurt them. And it's amazing how much faster the Holy Spirit can work than us. He can change that person's mindset like that, and they realize, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm going to stop. And the best thing is when the Holy Spirit does it, it lasts. It's not just a temporary change like we can convince somebody of doing. Okay? Number three, by inviting the unchurched to attend. Luke 14, 16 to 23, and this is a little longer, so hold on. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything now is ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and the alleys and the towns and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, What you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, Go out into the roads and the country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. God wants his house full. That's his desire. And he's desired to use you to do it. So we are called to invite others. We are called to share others. To make the use of every opportunity. And I know for some of you, this scares you to death. Okay, I will do anything, just don't ask me to do that. Well, I'm sorry, but that's your primary objective. That's your primary responsibility. And it's expected as part of being a member in this church that you will do what God has asked you to do. But he doesn't ask you to do it alone. He doesn't ask you to do this with your own wisdom, your own insights, your own strength, your old bold, own boldness. No. He just asks you to step out and he'll take it from there. He will fill you with what you need. And that's where things get exciting. Number three is I will serve the ministry of my church. First point there is by discovering my gifts and talents. First Peter 4.10, each one of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Did you know you have gifts and talents? Raise your hand up if you think you have a gift or a talent. Okay, everybody raise your hand up, otherwise you're a liar and you're lying in church and that's just bad. You don't want to do that. You have gifts and talents. Let me suggest this. You have gifts and talents that you don't even know about. Think about that for a minute. You have things within you that you haven't developed yet because you don't even know they exist. Well, my call to you is this. Learn what they are, and together we're going to develop them. One of my visions is that this church sends out teams to other churches to minister. But I want to make sure we as a church are raising up within ourselves the giftings and the talents that God has given so that we can do that. The next point is by being equipped to serve by my pastors. I mentioned this briefly already, but I just want to give you the, the Bible verses to back it up. In Ephesians 4, 11 to 12. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. God's called me as a pastor. That means it's my job to equip the saints for the work of ministry. You are the saints. Okay? 
If you really want to go with it, you can put that in front of your name. You can introduce yourself to others. I'm Saint. Do it. I want you to look at your neighbor right now and tell them I'm Saint and say your name. How does that make you feel? Like a liar? We got some honesty here. But that is scripture. You see, unfortunately, the Catholic Church has distorted this so much that we think a saint is somebody who's elevated above the rest. Okay, uh, In the Catholic Church, you have to have three miracles that you do, and then they can bestow upon you sainthood. Okay, And they have to be verified miracles. We've taken that in, in our understanding and say, okay, in order to be a saint, you need to be way up here. You need to be above the rest. That is so totally unbiblical. Okay, That is not in the Scriptures. A saint is a believer in Jesus Christ. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are a saint. Maybe you don't act like it, but you are a saint. You just got some rough edges you got to clean off. Okay, but it's my job to equip you. My job to to give you what you need to carry out ministry. So I get the fun job. Um, but you guys get to do the real work. And then the next point is by developing a servant's heart. Philippians 2, 3 to 7 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should not look only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who is the very nature of God. Do not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. We are all servants. Okay? Uh, we do not have the right or the audacity to promote that we are better than anybody else. We are servants, first and foremost. Just like Jesus Christ came to serve, in his likeness now we serve others. Number four, I will support the testimony of my church by attending faithfully. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Faithfully attending. Wow, that's a big request. But you know what? I was up at 5 o'clock this morning watching a hockey game. How many people were up at 5? At six, yeah. The last goal. How many people find it hard to get to church at 10 o'clock? <laughs> yeah, what's up with that? Motivation, right? If you're motivated, you can do anything. If you're not motivated, uh, you kind of want to just sit on the couch. When we talk about faithfully attending, that means that you're relationship in the body of Christ is more important to you than anything else out there. That is a crucial thing in your life. You want to see what God is doing in the lives of your brothers and sisters more importantly than anything else you could go do in this world. And it really comes down to an attitude of what's most important. What is your priorities? I want to stress to you the importance of attending faithfully. The next one, by giving regularly. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 says, On the first day of every week, each one of you must set aside the sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collection will have to be made. I want to say this. As a church, we have been blessed. Okay? And I'm going to be honest with you. I always thought that... When we met our budget every month, that was good enough. And then I realized that we need to dream bigger. That we need to have a bigger vision for this community, for this city, than we currently have. It doesn't matter whether or not the church budget is being met. Okay, We, we kind of put that up front and, and we look at that. That's not the issue. The issue is whether or not each individual person is giving faithfully. That is the key. That is the healthiness. Like, just because your church meets your budget doesn't mean you have a healthy church. Doesn't mean that. You have a healthy church when every person is giving faithfully. 
So please, if, if that's something that challenges you, pray about it. Okay, The Word of God is clear, and, and it comes from this passage and other references, that before you give, consider what you're giving. Okay, Pray about it. If you're married, talk to your spouse. Say, how much are we going to give? Don't be afraid to, to give sacrificially because God always can outgive you. Okay, But take a look at it. Have that agreement. And I always say that because it's never happened in this church, but we've all probably been to other events someplace uh, where they give the so-called uh, offering call, and it can take like an hour and a half. Have you ever been in one of those services? Right? And they're trying to convince you and convince you and convince you and convince you of what you should be giving. Okay, That should never happen. And as long as I'm pastoring this church, that will never happen here. Because you should go home, you should think about what you're giving, and then you bring your gift in and give it. Okay, It's something you do as when that happens, somebody can't guilt you into giving more. Okay, Because you've prayed about it, you've sought it out, you know what God wants you to give, and if you give what God wants you to give, then who cares what any person says? right? Consider that. The last one is by living a godly life. Philippians 1.27 says, Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you only to hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith for the gospel. You are an example. The way you live, the way you behave, is an example to everybody who knows you. And if they see you acting in a certain way, and then you invite them to church, they will automatically associate your lifestyle with that church. And that's why people outside of the walls of churches think Christians are hypocrites. It's a justifiable thought. We need to be careful that the testimony we're putting out is a testimony that represents Jesus Christ. And I'm going to let the the Holy Spirit speak to you on that one. If there's areas of your life that you need to hand over to God and say, God, yeah, I'm falling short here. Go to him, offer it up to him, and let's see what he will do with your life. But what we are committing to is that we, as a group, are going to live lives that are godly lives. We are going to strive to live lives of good testimony. Now, when we look at all of these things, I hope that... There's nothing that kind of stands out and says, oh, I can't commit to that. I hope that when you look at this list, you say, yeah, you know what, that's something I can, I I want to commit to, but I have this issue or this issue or that problem. That's okay. You're still going through a refining process. God will take care of you. Okay. But what we're looking at is we're looking for people who quite frankly are tired of going to church and are ready to be the church. That's what we're looking for. And we're not looking for perfection, because it doesn't exist. When it talks about the end, when Jesus returns, it's very neat because the Jesus returns because the bride has made herself ready. Okay, At that point, she's made ready when he returns. But the fact that he hasn't returned tells us we're not made ready yet. We are making ourselves ready. And the bride is the church. Okay, We are making ourselves ready. We're not perfect, nor do we expect people to be perfect. But we do want hearts that are striving towards God's perfection, okay, through his grace and his mercy. So I want to end with this. Hebrews 3, verses 12 to 13. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. God, we thank you for this church, for this congregation, Lord. I thank you for each one who is here. And God, as we are on the verge of of discovering new territory in your kingdom, God, that each one of us would feel that we have a role to play. God, that you would draw out of us the gifts and the talents and the abilities that we require to do what you want us to do. 
And God, each one in this place has a role to play. Nobody is insignificant. Nobody is left out. And God, I am excited personally about what you're going to do through these people. God, I am excited about what you're going to do in this city. Lord, because you do all things good. And we get to be a part of that. So, Lord, I pray if there's, there's any trepidation or any weariness in this place, God, that it will be removed. Lord, that we set our eyes on you and they will not stray to the right or to the left. And, God, we will see your promises come forth. And this church, God, will be a church that offers up a sweet aroma into your nostrils, Lord, as one that is pleasing and one that is doing the will of the Father here on earth. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.